And now we take you to London, England, where acclaimed British intellectual Norina Hutz is standing by for her live radio broadcast. Mega Hutz, London Calling. Opinions and conversations from a British point of view about Europe, America, and everything British. This is not your father's BBC. No stiff upper lip, no keep calm and carry on, no tea and crumpets or tally ho. It's opinions and fresh perspectives from politics to pop culture and everything in between. It's honest, fun, raw, and unfiltered. Live from London, this is Megahertz London Calling with your host, Narina Hertz. Good day, America. I'm Narina Hertz, live from London, and this is Megahertz the show that brings you the sharpest minds and brightest voices from Britain and Europe. Today, I'll be discussing anti-Semitism in Britain's Labour Party with one of the United Kingdom's foremost novelists and journalists, Howard Jacobson. Imagine the Democratic Party had been hijacked by anti-Semites. That's what I believe we're dealing with over here. Welcome, Howard. Hello. But we're not only going to focus on the present. We'll be delving into the past with historian and television star Bethany Hughes. Bethany has spent the last 10 years exploring the history of Istanbul, one of the most colourful and fascinating cities in the world. Hello, Bethany. Hello. We'll be looking into the future with sci-fi author James Smythe. His latest novel, I Still Dream, looks at artificial intelligence. Is it the next great technological revolution? Or should we be pretty scared? It's great to have you here to discuss this with James. Thank you. And with us in the studio today too is Megahertz regular, television and movie producer Danny Cohen. Hello, Danny. Hello. Now, August is the time of year when many people take off on vacation. But one of the big questions nowadays is, do you leave your phone at home? How many of us are really able to switch off from our digital lives when we are on holiday? I'm asking this because official UK data that came out last week revealed that 78% of Brits say they cannot survive without their phones. James, when you go on vacation, are you able to separate yourself from your digital life? I am, yeah. I I kind of rely on the place that I'm going to do it for me a little bit. So before we had free roaming tariffs and we could use our data wherever we liked across the EU, uh, it was useful to go somewhere and think, well, I'm not going to pay to use roaming. So I'm reliant on maybe Wi-Fi in that one bar that we go to a couple of times a week. So apart from that, I'd switch entirely off. I think it's quite a useful it's a useful bit of clearing for your head. It's, it's a nice to get a bit of air, frankly, away from that noise. Bethany, do you tweet on the beach? Uh, I do. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love my phone. I I love the uh, vistas it opens up for me. I love the fact you can research the etymology of a word on the beach or communicate with somebody. I I think it's the most beautiful thing. Um, I I really, really, really don't want to sound smug, but it's like any tool. So as long as you're using it rather than it using you, what's not to like? So no, I think it's a thing of of beauty and truth, but it should never be antisocial. That's the thing. It's like picking your nose. You know, if you're going to go and do that, go and do it in the loo. If you're going to use your phone antisocially and take it away from the people around you put it down how do you think do you think it's important for creativity to disconnect from the online world i think it's important for life to disconnect i think phones are horrible i hate my phone and i'm on it all the time and i'm consumed with shame because i'm on it all the time i even take it away on holiday and and i have to and i open my phone in the morning when my wife is not there because I don't want her to see what I've been reduced to. <laughs> the problem with me and a phone is I'm, I'm somebody that's been waiting for a message all my life. The message, the message. Something will, a word from God or a word from uh, Spielberg or some, the word, that would, something that will completely change my life. And even now, nothing could possibly change my life. I am still waiting for it. And the phone, the phone is the media. It used to be the post. I would run to the, as soon as I heard the post come, I would run just as a dog does. To, to get the mail, I would run to get the mail. Now it's a phone. It's a shameful, shameful thing, and I hate to have to confess to it. So, Danny, you're you, you're trying to um, you're trying to do less phone, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, I, I I actually feel I'm in the same situation <laughs> as Howard, where I'm addicted, uh, but I'm I'm unhappily addicted. 
Um, I have to say, though, on holiday, on vacation, I'm pretty good at thinking, OK, I'm going to put it in the safe and not get it out. And I, I am able to do that. And and the the thing is, even one day without it, you feel better. And you realise the whole time, it's for me, it's draining you all the time. It's draining you all the time. It's only when you stop do you realise how much it's draining you. You don't put your ear to the safe to see if it's ringing. To see if it's ringing, no. No, on holiday, somehow. You're, somehow, free. You're a free man. Yeah, somehow on vacation I'm able to put it away. But the rest of the time I, I feel unhappily but addicted. There is something about physically distancing yourself. So whether yeah. it's what you were saying, James, just going places where you can't get reception and you can't get Wi-Fi or putting it in the safe... I mean, because we are so drawn to it, because we get that dopamine rush when it, when it, when it pings, or when we see its little face, our phone's face. Um, there is something to be said about just putting it physically away. When I'm writing, I try and have the phone, my phone, just not within reach or even within sight. I don't. I'm feeling like I'm I'm becoming an apologist for the phone. I can't believe it as a historian. But I think, as I, was, I think it's something. It says something very beautiful about the human species that we want to be connected. We want to exchange ideas, and we've been doing it. That move to Howard after years, this. You know, if you go right back to the very earliest societies, what we're choosing to do is to write move to Howard after this. Share, create figurines, pass them on to the nearby village. So I think the phone is just the technological extension of that. So no, that's I think not. Just, that's but, not what you're talking about now. Is sharing and connecting yeah. and people meeting when you're on the phone you're gone you're not connected to anything really it's an illusion there's just you and that vile screen you're out of the world <laughs> I mean I'd love to be back uh, uh, exchanging what little figurines It'd be wonderful to give someone a figurine well I'll tell you what Make some figurines, <laughs> take some photos of them and share that on your no, phone on not the beach. The same. And then you'll no, be doing, you'll be travelling no, in time. Idea. Not the a same. portable 3D printer that you can just make little figurines for people when you meet them and just hand them out. Great. Bring yeah, it it's on. still digital though, isn't it's it? It's still digital, okay. unfortunately. From little figurines to, um, to somebody who's a rather big global figure. Now, I know Americans hear a lot about President Trump. But I wanted to give you, my listeners, a sense of how your president is perceived over here in Britain. And I can't think of anyone better to provide this than best-selling, multi-award winning author and journalist Howard Jacobson, whose most recent book, Pussy, is a biting satire on no other than your president. Howard, is there something about Trump that is particularly jarring for us as Brits? Yes. Um, it's his... Uh, inability to put two words together. It's his inability to make a sentence sound like a sentence. I'm not asking him to be a poet or an orator. It's just his apparent unfamiliarity with words and what <laughs> words are for and what you wor use words to do. It's his unfamiliarity with the whole idea of making any kind of connection. I know when we see him on television making a connection with, with huge audiences, this is, for me, and I think for other Brits that I know, a complete mystery. Why do people like that? It's as if people cheer Trump for all the things that you normally expect a person who would be cheered to have charm, he doesn't have any loquacity, he doesn't have any um, um, persuasiveness he doesn't have any intelligence insight, kindness, generosity warmth, intuition he has none of the things that make a, a leader a leader or indeed a person a person it's a, it is terrifying to me um, I can only speak for me, I can't speak for the whole country, <laughs> it is terrifying to me because it's as though we have reached a stage in in our civilization, where what people most want is that the absence of any sign of civilization. He would seem to me to be one of the most uncivilized men. Who, is this extreme? He would seem to me. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to I'm say. Sure our I'm going to say. Worse. He strikes yeah. me as one of the most, and perhaps the most uncivilized being in every sense of the word that has ever lived. Oh, wow. Um, just, just Bethany, because I have a historian here. Mm. I mean, is this too big a claim? Well, I, I, well. It fits it absolutely into a historical pattern. So I first came across Trump when um, a psychiatrist was looking at those um, with power who have narcissistic personality disorders, and she was starting with Nero. This was before uh, he, he achieved his ultimate game. And she said, oh, and the perfect example of this is this, you might have heard of him, this guy called Donald Trump. So that's who I think of him, of, as a man with narcissistic personality disorder. I don't think it is extreme. I was just, I've just come from um, the Syrian border, so I've been in Jordan, just 
two miles away from the shelling, which we could hear every night. And the one thing the kids there talked to me about was Trump's visit to Britain. And they said, why have you welcomed this man to your country? And isn't it fascinating that those kids, I have to say, who knew about this because they had their phones with them. So that's how they'd heard about it through, <laughs> still through Facebook. The I am still, but you know, isn't that interesting <laughs> that that connected them? And they, it's, you know, his, the word he uses the whole time is pride. And you have to accept that in the story of civilization, one man's pride is another man's humiliation. And they felt humiliated by his actions. So that's, I wouldn't want to welcome somebody who makes it his business to humiliate others. Well, Howard, there have been other American presidents who have been disliked here in the UK. I mean, George W. around the Iraq War, he he was disliked and uh, the left didn't like Ronald Reagan when they saw him as brother in arms with Margaret Thatcher. Nixon. Nixon as well. So it, Well, Nixon it, got his, so that's just, justice was done there. But the other two, I always thought we felt slightly sweet towards them, slightly <laughs> kindly towards Bush and indeed Reagan, because the one thing that you could say about them is they knew they weren't very bright. Yeah. There was that kind of look on their faces, and when they, when they heard somebody, if they'd have heard Obama speaking, they'd have looked on in admiration. They knew, if they, they have no intelligence in themselves, but they knew what intelligence and wisdom and kindness and refinement they knew what those qualities were in other people and could appreciate them. Trump is incapable of appreciating that in other people. Hmm. Now, Trump is clearly a divisive figure, but an increasingly divisive politician over here is Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. The Labour Party is in many ways similar to the Democratic Party. Traditionally, it's been the main left of centre party in British politics. Its current leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is shifting the party to the hard left. One of the issues he's under fire about is anti-Semitism. Howard, you've written extensively about this. When we think of anti-Semitism, we think most obviously of anti-Semitism on the far right, but there always was a stream of anti-Semitism on the extreme left, wasn't there? Yeah, I think one of the reasons that the, our, the British Labour Party, and particularly its current leader, Corbyn, um, why these people are in denial about this, is they so don't think of themselves as like Nazis used to be. They don't wear jack boots, they don't wear swastikas, um, they don't want to take Jews out into the streets and shoot them, they don't do any of that. So they assume, therefore, that they cannot be anti semites But as you say, there are different kinds of anti semites and there's different forms of anti-Semitism. It's always... This may seem extreme, but I think it is uh, the history of the Jewish people to know this. It's always lurking somewhere. And in British politics, it lurks at the extremes of parties. And as long as it lurks at the extremes of parties, we kind of all live with that. There it is. There's got to be a little place for everything hideous in our community. And at the extremes of political parties, it's there. And it feels safe there because it will never come out. The strange thing that's happened over here is that um, the extreme of the Labour Party has come into the centre of the Labour Party. With Jeremy Corbyn, was n nobody would ever have dreamed that he would come to any kind of power in the Labour Party, let alone lead it. Yeah, he was at the fringes all the time. He complained. He was just uh, he was a fixture. Yeah, he, he never he, agreed he, with he, anything. And he was he was just a no name, not recognised member a bit of, a joke, of parliament. To be honest, he yeah. was the extreme figure at the ultra left of the party. He was a bit of a joke. You'd never imagine him having to make a decision or make the kind of compromises that real politics demands. And then. Because because he was so ideological. A series of yeah. kind of complex events, he ended up becoming leader, and and that's what's changed things. Yeah. So what? Well, so he's brought with him from the edges all that all that ideological baggage, really, which is, um, and he is unusually he is unusually obdurate about, unusually obstinate about that baggage. He won't let any of it go. Um, and the part, and the part he most won't let go is his uh, deep antagonism to, to Israel. Uh, antagonism to Israel is common in this country. Uh, it's felt by uh, some version of it, of it or rather it's felt by everybody, including Jews. Uh, there is a fallacy that makes one very angry over here that Jews are trying to suppress... When Jews accuse anybody of anti-Semitism, they're trying to suppress criticism of Israel. Nothing could be further from the truth. Indeed, criticism of Israel, if you really want to hear it, go to a Jewish house on a Friday night. You will hear criticism of Israel. And the feeble stuff you get from the left, it's racist, it's a racist endeavour, it's always been a racist. That is nothing to what Jews say. Jews are capable of being deeply critical and divisive on all questions, but 
particularly questions that relate to themselves. So the one thing that's really got to be argued with over here is this idea that when we call someone an anti semite it's because we're trying to silence them. We are not. The, the interesting thing, I think, is that the, this use of the word criticism. We're trying to silence criticism of Israel, as though we all know what criticism is. Critic What's criticism? I don't think you're a very nice country. That's criticism. I think you are, your leader is worse than Attila the Hun. You're fascists, you're Nazis. That's also criticism. But they're worlds away from one another. And I think Jews are right here to object when Jeremy Corbyn and the people closest to him talk about Zionism as a racist endeavour. This is not the same as saying we don't like the foreign policy of Netanyahu. I don't know anybody who does. I don't know any Jew who does. But to talk about Zionism, um, which was the ideal that, 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 that helped hundreds of thousands of Jews who'd been oppressed all over Europe to find some sanctuary, to talk about that as a racist endeavour is itself, I believe, and this is the nub of it really, I think that is an anti-Semitic thing to say. Not that you don't like the government of Israel, not that you're unhappy with its policies, but that the very formation of it was, was racist, I think is anti-Semitic. Because can you explain for our American listeners, because um, this, this is right at the nub of the one of the big current issues with Labour and anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a universally pretty much accepted definition of anti-Semitism, isn't there? It's yeah. a definition which everyone from the United States to Germany to Austria to the United Kingdom to the European Union accepts as a definition of anti-Semitism. And one of the big issues at the moment is that Labour, under Jeremy Corbyn, or the governing body of Labour, have decided to rewrite the yes, definition. Yes, they, they, they dare to claim they're making it friendlier. <laughs> We're actually making it nicer for Jews. <laughs> uh, the bizarre thing is that they've done this in the, at the middle of a, re, of, a, of a fight with the Jewish community that's been going on for years, really, heated up in the last few months. And right in the middle of this, they decide they will reject this definition. Why would they do that? It can only be felt as a snob to Jews. We don't care what you think, and we're going to show you that we don't care what we think. And I think the other reason is that I think that if you hold to that definition, Jeremy Corbyn and a number of his cronies and other members of the far left of the Labour Party are, are definitionally anti-Semitic. I mean, well, because, that... because the bit of the definition which they've taken out is they're saying it's fine to be, to say, anti-Zionist. Yeah. Things. And also, it's, I'll give you I'll give it in one yeah. example. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn decided on Holocaust Memorial Day a few years ago to host an event in Parliament called From Auschwitz to Gaza, comparing uh, what's going on in Gaza, uh, which, you know, as Howard said, you know, most Jews in Britain would feel very unhappy about to to the death camps and the extermination of, of six million people. Now that and to do that anyway, see on Holocaust Memorial Day is is so antithetical to to um, goodwill, to kindness. It's malevolent, I think. It's malevolent. so antithetical to smart political thinking and smart. Well, it's incompetence at as the well. very yeah, yeah, the very yeah. at the very best. So, it's... Yeah. So so in doing that, I think he would he would fail. He would be an anti semite under the widely recognised definition of anti semitism. So I think this mixture of malevolence towards the Jewish community, frankly, with with a need to protect himself and other anti semites and Labour Party from a definition which would label them clearly as anti-Semitic. And, and yet the clause that they're trying to remove, which they say they have to remove it or change it because it stops criticism of Israel, doesn't. The actual phrase they've removed says it's perfect. It is not anti-Semitic to be to to treat Israel as you to be to be as critical of Israel as you would any other country. And it would appear that they can't accept that, that they must be more critical of Israel than they are of any other country. So they want to make an exception of Israel. And Jews quite rightly say, well, why, why would you want to do that? And you, there's no knowing now how far Corbyn will go to stick to this. Mm. I mean, he could. Re this is a moment in which the Labour Party ought to be fighting our Conservative Party over Brexit. We're in a turmoil in this country. Nobody knows what to think. We can't. We are terrified of what's coming. The Labour Party. This will be a golden opportunity for them to, to to beat the Tories in any coming election. It would also be a golden opportunity for them to win more support. They'd have my support if they could deal with Brexit properly. But they can't even do with this because Corbyn. Also also actually is with the Conservatives on Brexit because Brexit is capitalist. It's not just Israel so behind think, them, think, it's I capitalist, think, think it's the a, West. I think this is um, an important point because I think Corbyn's strand of anti-Semitism is really coming from the extreme left, left anti-capitalist um, 
ver- anti-colonial, anti-colonial yeah. um, version of socialism. And, um, and for him, Israel represents the kind of ultimate capitalist project project. and colonialist it's got everything it's got everything right for them to hate it's got jews in it it's It's bringing bethany and james after this what looks like an imperialist enterprise in it it's perfect it gives i mean i can understand why that why they why they why the the present uh, labor party feels it needs to or at least the corbinites need to hang on to this because it's their raison d'etre you do wonder without this what they would actually Mm. have that would distinguish them now howard you're jewish so am i as jews we're really concerned about this Bethany and James, as non-Jews, do you think this issue is firmly on the wider British public's radar? I, I think it does. And actually, I think the traditional media are doing very well in making sure it's page three, page four, page five. You know, it's a double page spread. So we, our attention is being drawn to it. And I think what's happening as well, it's very interesting, Danny, that you described Jeremy Corbyn as a joke before um, he was voted in. And we were talking about Trump before. And of course, everybody thought Trump, well, not everybody, he was described as a laughing matter. So I think what we've got to analyse is why it is that these people that we thought were jokes have such traction, have such enormous enormous appeal and why it's possible for ideas to calcify into ideologies mm. and for, for a mass of people to feel comforted by that rather than scared. I think that's right and I think the other thing that's really interesting about that is the similarity between Corbyn and Trump is that the cult of personality they've developed means that their supporters will not believe anything bad about them. Whatever facts or evidence you present to a Trump supporter, they just won't believe it. Whatever facts or evidence you present to a Corbynite about him and the anti-Semitism, they literally won't believe it. And it's a world in which facts don't matter anymore because of this cult of personality. A digital word in w- a world is, in which facts James, don't this matter. This is hit yes. all James. politicians, right, though, because Corbyn essentially got in on the Bernie Sanders vote, right? He was essentially, we went, oh, look, we've got our own Bernie. Mm-hmm. We've got this older socialist guy who's going to change the country and blah, blah, blah. But everybody had that exact thing. You still have the Bernie Sanders fans who will not hear a bad word. You have the Hillary fans. Like, everybody has that. And I feel like one of the things that we're really wanting in in politics, in British politics, in world politics, is a return to that idea that we're actually looking at what people stand for rather than those sound bites. But we can't get away from the sound bites because that's the culture that we have created now. So we're sort of, we're Ouroboros, right? We're just constantly going around in circles. And I find that really, really tricky. There's a, there's a very interesting... I, I have to bring it back to the classical world because <laughs> I always do in my head. Um, Herodotus has this great line where he says it's always far easier to persuade a crowd, a mass of 30,000 people than it is one man. And this notion that that power of demagoguery and the power of the herd and the fact... Amplified that, by social media. Uh, completely mm-hmm. amplified. And very interesting, Howard, that you mentioned digital, the digital world mm-hmm. um, buttressing this. There's been a very interesting study done on digital democracy and saying that actually, although we think this is going to be the solution to the democracy, Problem. Everybody can then yeah. two vote more questions on when this. you vote at home. Yeah. Two phone, more on questions. Tuesday, you on make this. a more selfish decision than you do when you physically get up and go into a ballot box and realise that you are an individual making a vote that counts, rather than being part of a herd. So I think again, we're entering this really extraordinary age. The digital age has talked about a, a great deal, but where we've got to recalibrate what we do intellectually and philosophically and politically and what was the, what with does that it mean digital to be power. Responsible citizens yeah. in that age. How I think I think we need to view what's going on in the UK when it comes to anti-Semitism within a broader context, though, of what's going on in Europe as a whole. Um, just to share some recent figures with you. In the United Kingdom, we saw anti-Semitic violent attacks increase by 34% last year. There's been an increase in anti-Semitic attacks in France and Germany over the past year. In Central and Eastern Europe, the situation is even worse. Recent surveys showed that one in five people in Lithuania and Romania would not welcome a Jew as a fellow citizen. Where does this end, Howard? I've written novels asking that very question. In fact, I wrote one novel called Jay a few years ago, which imagined the world emptied of Jews, because I think it's a possibility. Or at least if it's... And then, and then, and then on a calmer day, I say, of course, it's not a possibility. We often have conversations at home. Would we know when the time to go is? Would we know? It's melodramatic, but would we know? If we'd been in Berlin in 1928 or 29, would we have known, pack our bags and go? Some people did. 
Some people said, it's time to leave. Other people, and you might think at the time, the more rational ones said, nah, nah, that's silly. So at the back of your mind, if you're Jewish, is that feeling that you you mustn't be mad about this, you must be rational, you love the country you live in, you, I mean, I love England, I'm completely English, I speak its language, I te teach its writers, I emulate its writers, I'm English before I'm anything. But at the back of my mind is that fear that what if there are people here who will see me as a Jew first and then mean harm to me? The Jew has, this has been going on for a long Long time. It is not the normal kinds of racism. People don't it, that, that makes people frightened of, of black people and so on. This goes a way, way back. It's inscribed in theology. It's to do with Christianity. It's to do with the fact that the Jew was the person who killed Christ. It's also to do with the fact that the Jew was the person that the Jew was the person who invented Christ. We've got a double double crime here, <laughs> and people and we are the perfect people to turn to. We also, we, and we feed conspiracy. That's to say conspiracy theories. I should put that another way. Conspiracy theories fed by the accursed internet feed on this. So you could find, you look up, you look up Jews, Jews behind this, that Jews did 9-11, Jews did everything. This stuff is alive and well on the internet and it doesn't bode well. But if you're asking me where it will end, I don't know. I don't think it will ever end. I think it probably will stay like this with people blaming Jews for the foreseeable future. And has it now got to the stage where you think maybe the time would be to pat one's bag? Are we at that point? No, no. I'd have been, because I'd have been one of the ones who'd have stayed in Berlin. Oh. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you, Howard Jacobson. If you haven't read his books already, I strongly recommend you do. He's a brilliant writer and also very funny. You might want to start with the Finkler question, Jay, that we've just talked about, or, of course, Pussy. From a complex present to a complex future... I want to turn now to a topic I'm thinking about a lot, artificial intelligence, AI. And I'm delighted James Smythe is with us today as he's been thinking a lot about this too. James is one of the most lauded writers of his generation, appealing to a huge range of adults and young adults. As well as novels, he's also written narratives for games and is currently working on a top secret blockbuster for Sony. His latest novel, I Still Dream, looks at the implications of AI. Now, when I use the phrase artificial intelligence or AI, I'm really talking about machines that are able to work or behave like humans, yep. kind of souped up versions of us, faster, smarter. Is that is that how you would define it? Uh, yeah, there are two types of AI when we talk about AI. There is uh, There's something called narrow AI, which is a single process. So everything that we use, every bit of technology is essentially running artificial intelligence. So the text, uh, the text messaging app in your phone is an artificial intelligence. Twitter is an artificial intelligence in its own way. The predictive text on your phone is an artificial intelligence. And those are narrow AI. They are uh, designed to do one specific thing and they do that thing very well. That is an artificial intelligence. There is then strong AI, and strong AI is what you're kind of thinking of. So the definition really is an artificial intelligence that can do very, very many things. And what they kind of mean by that is when it reaches the point that it can do what a human can do. Mm. It can do lots and lots of things very well, and then all of a sudden we're in the singularity and robots mm. have taken over and we've lost the world. So on that point, I yeah. really enjoyed your book, um, but it is pretty dystopian. And when, when I think about movies or books that tackle AI, they do typically paint a pretty scary, doomsday-esque vision of, of technology. Why is this? I think our fascination with anything is the idea that what we create can destroy us. That's a thing that's gone back in fiction for hundreds and hundreds of years, gone back for thousands of years. And the same stands with artificial like intelligence. Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a great example. Frankenstein is, it could be argued it's a novel about an artificial intelligence, and I could probably argue that in another situation for a long time. But there is a... Uh, with artificial intelligence, we looked at the sort of hypothetical. So we think of AI in films. For example, Terminator is probably the most famous example of artificial intelligence in a film. And that has two things. That's got killer robots uh, and friendly robots. But it's also got uh, this sort of nebulous Skynet artificial intelligence that's going to press a button and launch nuclear weapons and destroy the world. And... We enjoy the idea that something we've created can destroy us because then we can send ourselves in to fix it. That's ultimately what we like doing as storytellers. I think it's more interesting to think about if realistically, if we create something, it's not going to destroy us by blowing it up. It's going to destroy us by being a snide child or by making us feel bad about ourselves or telling us it's disappointed in us. And I think that that's a more 
we're humans raising something. And I think it's more interesting to look at ways that it might destroy us that aren't just let's blow everything up. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to do in the book was sort of examine exactly what that might be. How can it almost use ourselves against us rather than just going, well, Let's yeah, because one of, one of the bits in the books, I don't want to give spoilers because I hate, I hate getting spoilers, but there is this bit in the book where um, the AI, in order to help the um, person who uses it and who's trained it, actually ends up sending all these... Um, emails out yeah there's there's to... there's a little bit of the book that when cambridge analytica happened i sat there as my book was going to print and just went oh no this has ruined my life uh there is there is a sense that we are giving everything to uh to the cloud we are giving everything to computers we are giving up every bit of information about ourselves and if those things are powered by ai and the most interesting one to me is is google's ai google's ai is called deep mind there is actually apparently two ais at google that they're working there's one at google x and nobody knows what goes on at google x so we don't talk Which about to it to me in itself is disturbing the very disturbing. fact <laughs> the very fact that google this uber powerful uber rich ultra rich company won't tell anyone what it's doing with this stuff to me mm -hmm. just feels intrinsically disturbing so there's deep mind is fascinating deep mind is hundreds of little projects all built around using an ai so the book starts with a quote from deep mind uh that was a real thing they set up deep mind as a customer services assistant and they wanted to see if when you phoned up google or when you logged in and typed onto your computer that you wanted help with google could it fool humans into thinking they were dealing with a a, a real human rather than a computer and so they started asking it questions to see if they could break it and they started asking it for example what is the meaning of life and it decided that the meaning of life was to live forever and then they said well what is mor what's morality what's immorality and its answer to what immorality was was the fact that you have a child that's a direct quote <laughs> because this ai had gone right well if the meaning of life is to live forever you create something that simply cannot live forever Therefore, that's an immoral act. And that, to me, is when I went, oh, my God, with this thing's going to kill us. Because if we're teaching something to have a sense of morality, to be able to judge, that's a terrifying state of affairs. And deep mind is the thing that, frankly, if you have a Google phone, powers all of the little things going on in your Google phone. It powers Google itself. Everything you ever type into Google is being fed into this great deep mind engine. So if you've ever Googled anything, deep mind's probably on some level, preparing to judge you for what you have searched for. And on this point of kind of the ethics within AI, I think one of the areas where it's really striking and where, where there are going to be some really huge ethical issues is around self-driving cars, yep. which is, of course, um, which is a form of artificial intelligence. So at the moment, all these cars are being trained, essentially, um, to behave in certain ways. So if they see a stop sign, they stop. If, they, um, if another car approaches, they should do why. But obviously, the car will have to make these kind of decisions, decisions like if they're driving along and a eld an elderly person walks in the street, across the street, do they swerve to not hit the elderly person even if they've got a baby on board? These are, these are big ethical questions, which at the moment, presumably we're leaving to Google to decide or whoever's, whoever's developing the... I mean, right now, I would imagine because it won't have the facial scanning stuff, so it won't. It will ultimately one day be able to do that, be able to guess who's on the road and work it out and decide who you are and whether you're worth killing or not. But at the moment, it'll be based around, you know, if I do this, will it injure the, the fewest possible people? The issue is going to get utilitarian. Yeah, very utilitarian. The issue is going to get bring really in Bethany on robots at home cars, after this right? and so how we it buy works. a car. So when we buy the car, actually, the most important thing is that we inside the car are safe. You want your family then to add. do the same thing. So the point then of add the AI after that. driving the car should be to protect you mm. against all others. But then, essentially, if that means that it mows into a crowd of people just so that you and your family are safe, hit the wall instead. Yeah, or mm. but it, what's it going to do? Because it can't, mm. it can't hurt you. So mm. if it has to injure someone else to save you, mm. does that mean that you're then a murderer because you've told your car to do this? Yeah, there are there are things that for legal massive cases things. There must be and... there must be law, legal teams who literally are doing nothing at the moment, yeah. just waiting for these things to what, break. What because... about the AI that we already use? 
in our homes, like Alexa, Bethany, do you do you have an Alexa? No, I have lots like, of I know I have but, lots of old cushions and rugs and throws, <laughs> and apart from my phone, hardly anything technological in my house at all. So no, I wouldn't uh, submit myself would, to would, an Alexa because because we we have an Alexa now at home, and I've I've actually grown quite fond of her. I just asked my wife. <laughs> She's called Alexa. <laughs> she isn't called Alexa, but she does a better job than Alexa. Yeah. I would imagine. I don't know. Would you, would you have? Would you have? So no, <laughs> because of the you don't want Amazon listening to every word. I, I don't see, want I any see. of it. I don't want any of it. <laughs> I don't want my phone. Okay, I've made peace with my horrible peace with my uneasy peace with my phone. But, but any other part of this go to add after this. I can't bear it. I mean, everything everything that you're saying is so is so fantastic. But I tell you what, it re- I mean, fantastically interesting and theological. Because what we're actually doing is th- this whole thing is blasphemous, and that's why yep. those stories are so good. Because we've taken the place of God when we make when, when Frankenstein makes the monster, he's taken the place of God. And in Jewish folklore, of course, there is the golem, the golem, which is an early version of this. You you make this creature to, and the golem was a kind of Alexa, helped you out, defended you against anti-Semitism, it destroyed your enemies. The trouble is, it then went, it went, it then ran amok. And there was always, at the end of every Golem story, there was the feeling that we've done something terrible, that we've created something that we can't control, which, which is the fear you're yep. describing, now, is it not? This is fascinating stuff. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be talking more about AI and how it's going to transform our lives. Um, so we'll catch up with you after the break. Three and a half and we're out. Mm-hmm. I wonder when the earliest um, reference to the Golem is. It'd be really interesting to know what that date the there, are some quite, there are some medieval ones, aren't there? Uh, I think there were some oh, earlier ones than the yeah, famous the, 18th yeah. century yeah, yeah, yeah. Prague ones. Yeah. Anybody want some wine? Please have some bit. wine in the rain. Noreen, are you happy? Yeah. You know what you're going to go back in on? I mean, you can pick up on what Howard's just said or... Um, we've obviously not done the um, how it's affected, how it affects how we oh, communicate, week, week. which oh, was, as well would be good to yeah. which might be more yeah, interesting than the work stuff. You've only yeah, got so about I'm four sure minutes the um, yeah. with James now. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, thanks, Henrietta. Do you think the creation of Eve? I don't. Is a misogynistic version of it. Well, no, I don't, because the original creation of Eve, there's, it's not misogynistic. You know this that. Um, Genesis 2, look at, which is actually the first one that which was written. Which is the second, the, the second, one that we think of. When with, we, the, well, yes, and the one that actually was written first is Luke, one that says they created equally as the same Thanks. earth, with yes. it, you know, and all of that, and that just gets swept, gets quoted less, doesn't it? The, the, the rib version. Yeah, the rib is the, yeah. the rib is the one we remember, but the first one was out of the same earth with the same ideas. Do you know, I didn't even know there was a... Um, alternative, alternative narrative. And, so alternative narrative good. and <laughs> definitely, <laughs> much. definitely written earlier. Right. So it's, it gets superseded. Wow. I know. I'll send you that. I'll swap you that. Yeah. That, uh, that reference for an L.A. gluten-free yeah. restaurant. Norena, can you ask, <laughs> can you ask <laughs> Bethany to move closer to you because the camera can't see her? Can you move a, a bit robot. closer to me when we go in? This way? Oh. This way? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> it feels good. It's good. It feels very natural. <laughs> I'm right yeah, up my, against. <laughs> like in the tube. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Really good. We're all very cosy in here. Wow, time's going very fast in this yeah. show, isn't it? It's like going... Standing up's quite good, isn't it? Isn't it, it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's more engaged, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's a... Discovery. Anybody here right standing up? That's oh, no, I, I think you I have know. a standing I desk. Do yeah, but you, you could, yeah, I've, I have know you people tried? who do it. No. Uh, no, I know people who do it. Do you know Nick Harkaway? No. Uh, no, yeah. yeah, so he, he's one, someone who really, really is very like standing desk is great, moving around. I think he's got one of those desks that move that, yeah, that goes up and down, <laughs> which I'd really like the one idea minute. of. One minute. But I find it. You do need to mix between the two, but yeah. I don't write. I mean, it's for computer work and emails and stuff. Mm. I can see that being the thing when I yeah. stop writing and I turn on yeah. Safari or Twitter or whatever, yeah, being able nice. to move away from. Yeah. Um, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't stop. Uh, we don't stop. Oh. Um, we've still how long have we got? So, uh, how long have we got? 30 yeah, seconds. Kind of engagement when you're yeah. standing. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. 30, 30 seconds. Yeah. Right. 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Just, you know, for some reason, I'm not hearing you great. So really? Can you hear me better now? Yes, yeah. Okay. I'll that. lead. I'll lean close. Okay. Thanks. But, but. Yes. Did she know that it's coming seconds. through on the main audio? It's coming through. Oh, it's. Your it is now. Through. It will turn off. Ah, it will turn off. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. And we got to turn the aircon off. 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> Live from London, you're listening to Megahertz London Calling with your host, Norina Hertz, on Sirius XM Inside 121. This is Megahertz London Calling and I'm Norena Hertz with historian Bethany Hughes, novelist Howard Jacobson, movie producer Danny Cohen and author James Smythe, whose latest book looks at AI. Now, James, as we move into a future of advanced Alexas and series and smart fridges and the Internet of Things, we are going to be interacting more and more with machines. And one of the things I'm really interested in and thinking a lot about is how will that impact the ways that we relate to each other yeah that's an interesting i mean because everything whether we like it or not and i know you know you said you didn't have an alexa there is this everything is going to have something built into it in the next 10 15 years we're not going to be able to escape it your toaster will talk to you there is no uh, Sorry, Howard. There is no getting away from that. And <laughs> you have toast. <laughs> is there anything you can do to make the toaster toast a bit faster? <laughs> or is that a little basic? For I what's think you'll going end up having now. to buy a really old toaster that's ah. had all the safety stuff removed. <laughs> okay. And uh, but post Brexit, Britain will be fine because all the EU safety guards will be gone. So all the toasters will cook toast oh, in three and a half seconds. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be really fascinating is to do with kids. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've, I've got a 13-month-old son, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that my use of technology is drastically different to, to my parents' use of technology. To the basic thing that he hears us, we, we have an Alexa, we have one in the kitchen, he hears us turn on the radio by telling it to turn on the radio. He hears uh, me asking at the time if I need to know, you know, and that's incredibly lazy of me because I wear a watch, but still, he hears that. <laughs> and I feel like he is going to grow up with this vocabulary that that is is just the first time for him. He will just instantly be asking it to play his favourite songs. And it, it's a terse way of communicating, isn't it's it? Because we don't go, oh, Alexa, please, if you don't mind, my mum does. You... <laughs> my mum, my mum says uh, please and thank you to Alexa. <laughs> she honestly, she says, Alexa, can you turn the lights on, please? And in this very nice, polite voice, which I have become, I joke with her that I'm convinced that it's because if the robot uprising happens, they might spare her yeah. because she's been really nice. Yeah. So just so you know, I wasn't one of them. I didn't. Yeah. So I are that. you hoping that will spare you too? By oh, yeah. By, the, by virtue of consanguinity. When she's queen of the humans, as much as we might not you be. You will be the prince. Know, I'll be the prince. Yeah. I, I, well, I just have to share with you, there's this brilliant Greek myth. So going back two and a half thousand years about the invention of a robot called Talos, uh, who becomes human-like. And the only person who has the wisdom and power to prevent him becoming fully human is Medea, is a princess, is a woman. Because the men are all going, great, fantastic. Look at what we can do with these robots. And it takes a female to say, I think this might not be such a good idea. So she persuades Talos that she is going to turn him into a human by pulling out... A a bronze nail from his ankle and she does that and that releases his power and he just crumbles into dust. So there we are. Your mother has a beautiful <laughs> ancestor in the form of fabulous Princess Medea. Amazing. I'm quite struck by that. We're saying about the language of children there, yeah. because you actually you command Alexa to do things. Yeah, there's and no it, politeness, is there's there? There's no, and so if you get used to just commanding lots of different AIs to do things, do you as a child begin to get used to commanding other people yes. to do things? Well, of course you do. It becomes like you know, slaves used to be called man-footed things mm. because you just mm. gave them instructions. So mm. it is absolutely that. It's 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 generating. Um, well, it's it's generating an extraordinary immediate domestic hierarchy, isn't mm. it? Which which surely is pernicious and also i mean if you just think about how terrified teenagers are speaking on the phone so how they've become so how take how they're so oh, used yeah, now to gone, right? yes they're how they're so texting. used to texting that actually if you say to them you know call someone up they look at you aghast don't they so we could learn some very basic fundamental human to human communication skills well my wife was my wife was saying that she's going to start being polite to Alexa because she you wants need to move on to Bethany. To hear that and I know that's you know it, it's it's a strange thing right you very rarely hear people saying please and thank you anymore because people try to talk as little as possible when they're in in public for example and and you have that that sense that if there is this person not a person in our flat mm. that we talk to on relatively regular basis we should at least 
be nice to it, mm. and maybe he'll go, well, oh, that's what you do. You say please and thank you, and you ask it really nicely. Mm. Well, Would it make I, I, any difference if instead of calling it Alexa, you called it Trump? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Howard. Um, <laughs> now, I am going to be nice, and I'm going to say thank you, James Smythe, um, for coming on the show. I Still Dream is out now, and I recommend it for anyone looking for a gripping holiday read. Bethany Hughes is one of Britain's best-known and best-loved historians, who is known equally for her research rigour and accessibility as a broadcaster. For the past 10 years, she has been researching the Turkish city of Istanbul, a city which straddles the continents of Asia and Europe and has throughout history been at the epicentre of cultural and commercial power. It's the subject of her latest book, Istanbul. Now, Bethany, ten years is a long time to devote <laughs> to researching and writing. What, what drew you to the city? Well, I think the very fact that it's the longest surviving polity in Europe, so it's the oldest city in Europe, it sits, as you say, uh, between Asia and Europe, but more than that, it's the connector of North and South. It is the most cosmopolitan city in the world if you look at its life experience through time. So it's a city that matters. It matters to all of us and to all of our lives, even if we don't realise it. So I wanted to celebrate it, so that was partly why it took 10 years. Also, I make my life very hard when I'm writing a book that I think as a historian I can't write history unless I go to the place physically where it happened. And because Istanbul is right at the heart of continents and civilizations and cultures, that meant I had to travel to China and Iceland and Cornwall and all kinds of bizarre places in the Middle East in order to tell its story. So I was actually on the road a lot in honour of Istanbul. Wow. Now, one of the things that I found really fascinating in your book was um, to, to pick up on your cosmopolitan point was for how much of its history it was profoundly multicultural, multi-ethnic. Um, why, why was that so and how well did it actually work? I, I think just if you look at where it is geographically, it's, it's right at the centre of the world. Um, it was created as a world-class city by uh, an African Roman emperor, so immediately it had that influence of the south and the east. But it's, uh, there's something really interesting that happens to Istanbul. It's almost as if, if you look at the, the topography of the city, it's such an extraordinary place. It's garlanded by waters. It sits out in this kind of rhino horn of land. And it's almost as if the geography of the city has given the city such character and hubris, actually, that it allows it to be a character that's greater than its rulers. And so it's a city where its citizens have always had a voice. So I'm talking right from the ancient world through to the medieval world, through to the modern world. It's a city that's protean and poetic and a city of protest. And I think that has allowed there to be a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious flavour to it right across the centuries. Because in your book during, I was so interested to read that in the Ottoman Empire, it was a place where it was Muslims and Christians and Jews kind of coexisting, um, you know, in, in quite a remarkable way. Yeah, I mean, com completely. So it's it's always been a city of sanctuary. Um, it was founded as a city of sanctuary by the Emperor Constantine. Not, not you know, not a, not a man that we should look at with rose-tinted spectacles. Um, you Why, know, what was the worst well, thing well, <laughs> well, there's a strong possibility that he had his wife drowned in a bath. So, you know, immediately that makes you slightly <laughs> doubt his commitment to the kind Things of moral cause. In a marriage. Exactly, exactly. I'm sure it was a tough time. Um, but what, where he was he was very rigorous was his notion that this should be a city of social justice so he really believed that so it was set up very early on as this idea that if you get to its gates irrespective of your creed or colour you could be given sanctuary so it became a place where refugees flooded to from the 4th century AD onwards and actually it's the the, the biggest modern city which has the largest number of refugees anywhere in the world right, right now today and that's an unbroken line uh, across the years so it was a city of sanctuary a city of social justice Justice. There were these workshops set up so that the poor could be fed and could get a, a, a decent burial. There's this brilliant empress of the city, a medieval empress called Theodora, who everybody should have heard of. Please, at the end of this show, can she become a household name? So the empress Theodora. Theodora, put the, the lights on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Theodora, there we are. That's the challenge. Yeah. No, no, but Theodora would not put the lights on for you. So she starts Tell out. Tell us about Theodora. Oh, well, you know, how long have we got? She was an empress in charge of a million square.
square miles, but she starts out life right at the very bottom of the pile. So she starts out life, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, as a prostitute, an erotic dancer, an entertainer in the hippodrome from from the age of, from a teenage age. So she was uh, given to men to uh, to use for pleasure, but she was really, really, really smart. So she's employed as an imperial spy. She's spotted by the soon-to-be emperor Justinian, who falls passionately in love with her. They marry. She then becomes the empress. And as soon as she has power, what's extraordinary about her, and we're talking 1,500 years ago, she starts to reform the laws. So she outlaws pimping and sex trafficking and infanticide. And she sets up safe houses for fallen women and for single mothers. I mean, this is this is in the 6th century AD. So she is incredibly progressive and her spirit lasts in the city. So again, they adore her, Theodora. They think she's a wonderful woman. And it's almost as if that culture then pervades the the remaining centuries, as you say, right down to the Ottoman Empire, where uh, in the fall of Al-Andalus, Muslims and Jews flooded into what was then Istanbul and they gave them sanctuary. So it was a a place which we should look at actually as a a, a city that... Can we learn from it? I think we can, because it's a city that seems to me there's this beautiful, beautiful um, Greek word idea called xenia, which means the love of both strangers and friends. So it's the opposite of xenophobia. It's, in a it, way. It, xenophobia is, is is the fear of strangers, oh. but xenophilia is actually was a much more more common uh, concept at this time. And there is this notion that what you should do is you should welcome somebody across your threshold, even if there was a risk that they might steal your wife, your goods, your ideas. And it seems to me that Istanbul, in its very greatest iterations, is xenia incarnate. It's this notion that that we are better as a species and as a society if we welcome the strange, the unknown across our threshold. Now, um, presumably modern day Turkey is is not being so welcoming. Um, So when did this kind of real multicultural era end? Was it was it around the time of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and what? No, the first well, no, war or no? no, no, no. I mean, actually, again, kind of with Ataturk's project, it was still, you know, a very, very cosmopolitan city. Um, uh, religions were protected. Oh, again, obviously, I don't, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. We, we know about the genocides that have happened there. But it is an unusually cosmopolitan city. And that has carried on pretty much until yesterday. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a city that if you go and visit it, you can still find the the centre of the uh, patriarchate, the Greek Orthodox Church, you can still find a, a very youthful population. So it's a most of the pop- populace who live there are under 30 or 35. And it's a huge city. It's 100 yeah. miles um, wide. We all know that there are civil liberties that are being eradicated there. I mean, I've been there at times of, uh, by chance, of protests and coups, but it's an incredibly uh, tenacious city. It's a very pugnacious city, and it's a city that's not going to be eroded by uh, just the whim of, of one ruler. Now, when I was last in Istanbul, and it's a city that I really adore, um, I had a really fascinating tour around Topkapi Palace where I'd never been. And for me, one of the most intriguing parts was the harem. Can you explain for our listeners what the harem was and how it functioned? Because I just found it absolutely fascinating. Well, so the harem, and if you say the word harem, um, I think probably the image that comes into people's minds are those kind of 19th and 18th century oil paintings of lovely, luscious, uh, eastern-looking ladies, probably with not very much on, bathing one another with spring water or olive oil. You know, not much of that happened in the harem, to be honest. The harem was the royal household of the Ottoman Empire. It was where women lived. And it was both a terrible place to be, so you could end up being incarcerated there for your life as the slave of slaves. It could be an extraordinary place to be for women because actually, if you were lucky and smart, you could become incredibly rich in the harem and you could use both uh, political and cultural influence to make your mark on the world. So if any of us go to the city of Istanbul today and you look at the historic skyline, probably 50% of those buildings were paid for by women of the harem. Wow. So, they, uh, so they weren't just sex slaves sitting around kind of waiting for somebody to come and stroke their cheek. They were very active so players. the sultan was giving them money and that's how they were Yeah, because in money. in Islam uh, women can inherit uh, as well as men. This was a very, it was this the centre of power, the centre of wealth and so a lot of that wealth came through to the harem. So you have these incredible women um, like Safiye in the 16th century who was the 
the sultan's favourite. She gave birth to a son and then she becomes the valide, the, the mother of the sultan. And you can't be a more powerful woman um, in the Ottoman world than being the mother of the sultan. And if you look at her story, she's just brilliant. She founds uh, mosques and libraries and hospitals Interestingly, she's a bit like Theodora. You know, she's living on the site of the palace of Theodora, who was there a, a thousand years before, when she sees that the prostitutes of the city um, are two are minutes till close. She rushes out and tells him, you know, this is not what he's been put in power to do. And what I love about her is that uh, she sets up a very intimate correspondence with the Queen of England, Elizabeth I. So they write to one another. Yes. And uh, basically, if you look at the letters, they're kind of sorting out international and she politics. she started out as a she woman start, of humble... Humble, aren't she? Absolutely. So she was taken age 13, probably uh, as a Christian villager from a little village in Albania, but, but, but was, was, was clearly smart. So she writes these letters to Elizabeth I, and what they say is, look, kind of, the men are basically messing things up in the world. Let's just sort out international politics in a kind of good sense kind of way. You know, we'll sort out diplomatic uh, alliances... We'll release the prisoners. We'll release uh, those um, who've been taken hostage by pirates. So, so they do all this. And then, dare I say, because they're women, so they've sorted out international politics, there's this most fantastic postscript where they start to exchange they make up One tips. minute to close. So this is a concubine in the harem in Istanbul and the Queen of England. And uh, Safiye says, oh, hey, you've got lovely odiferous oils for the hands and face. Would you mind send, sending them to me? So it's the most brilliant mixture of a kind of high power relationship and beautifully intimate. So that's the kind of place that Istanbul is and the kind of relationships it allows women to have. And one of the things I really loved about the book is the space you gave to telling women's stories. Because so often in women in history women are ignored um so i just wanted to thank you really bethany so much for coming on uh istanbul a tale of three cities is out now it's such an impressive well-researched book from present day horrors to futuristic dystopias from sultans to presidents many thanks again to all my guests howard jacobson james smythe Danny Cohen and Bethany Hughes, and also to all of you who've listened in today. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. I'm Norena Hertz, and this is Megahertz, London Calling. <laughs>